Welcome to the Community and Economic Development Committee meeting, October 4th. I'm John Weddleton. Dick Trey. Pete Peterson. Dean Gates, City Council. Richard Byrne. Jack Frost. Ryan Yell. Mandy Honest, Clerk's Office. Forrest Dunbar. Christopher Constant. Dave. Dave Woodfield. Todd Sherwood. Municipal Law Department. Sherry Scurry of AMIA. Richard Smith, Alcohol and Marijuana Control Office. Daniel Dean. All right, thanks. So we have a uh, number of things on the agenda today, and I think we need to add something. We have a violation summary. Is we, do you want to go through that, or is this just a pressure? Yeah, so we'll add that. I think we'll make that the first thing. <coughs> so anything else? Okay, and then I just wanted to mention we had a bunch of AMCO's got a bunch of changes proposed, and comment period is December for all of them. Look at that. For sp which specific? Well, there's a variety. I printed some of one. You have um, uh, um, sm on-site smoking, which I didn't look at yet, but you had some others that are. Clarify establishments required to submit renewal applications, um, things like that. Just a, somewhat minor, but they might tie into our rules too. Yeah, uh, the first of those projects, I believe, close, public comment closes on Sunday. This Sunday? Seven. We won't make There's that. There's three of them that close Sunday. Mm -hmm. Three of them that close yeah. Sunday, yeah. Most of them close by the end of next week. I think there are about seven of them that are open right now. Yeah. And then the on site consumption regulation, the latest iteration of that, the deadline for comment is November the 1st. So that might be on our agenda for the next meeting. Okay, it's helpful. okay some reason I thought it was in December, so we need to put that on that. So, okay, just so you know that's coming. Yeah. Jed, how do they square the second half smoke ordinance that the state just passed, the city's second half smoke ordinance with on-site consumption? Well, it allows uh, municipalities to opt out. But what about the state law? Second, there's a carve out. There's a carve out in the state law for marijuana as long as it's in a um, separate standalone building. How does that protect the workers from second hand smoke? It 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 won't unless there's provisions in the marijuana ordinance that protects the second. So it will allow second hand smoke from people that work in the establishment to be affected by it. Yeah, there's provisions right now in the marijuana draft that for ventilation and segregating. And in a kind of like a plexi, well, I imagine a plexiglass kind of box, but that's not done yet, and we also don't know exactly what if that would be fully protective. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Miss Welsey, if you move to the seat next year, I could see you. Oh, oh, oh this seat somewhere, just like the seat. Or you can it's tables open. Tables open if you okay. like, and Todd as well. If you move. We got extra seats. Okay, so we have marijuana facilities violations summary July through September. Did you, Rich, is this yours? Yes. Can you go through this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the only two uh, facilities that we, as the municipality, had any action going with was Canabasca and Danish Gardens. Uh, Canabasca, you're very familiar with, um, were suspended through district cultivation for the month. And then Danish Gardens, we have to have a penalty hearing. Uh, for odor um, coming up on uh, uh, October, 31st. October 31st is the figuring date for that. Please. Okay, uh, Chris? Is that with the administrative hearing officer? Yes. And just there's a little date error. Yes, yeah, that uh, we are not planning to penalize them on 12 14. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that? Uh, the, their the last violation, violation occurs three months in the future. And it happens on 12, 14, no. It's just a little helpful. Anticipation. Yeah, we're see. working hard for the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what was that Tom Cruise movie? Minority Report. Should, uh, <laughs> yeah. should that be 17? Yes. The and the, uh, what, the word I got from the AMCO folks this morning was that uh, Raspberry Roots um, and uh, Homo's Bakery are being forwarded to the uh, AMCO board and the rest of them have been resolved uh, with the just NOP. Okay. 
sorry. It's hard to hear him speak up a little bit. Um, yeah, well, I was going to know the data error, but now I don't know if we've moved on. But I, I would like to hear more detail, perhaps that's your plan, on what exactly the Momo's Bakery transport violation was. Um, yeah. I'm curious. Well, the tran you know, the, the other two, we're, we're familiar with what odor violations are. Transport violation sounds like it could be more serious, but I'm not sure. I don't know in particular. Um, I just know that there's, um, there's supposed to be record keeping and there's time frames and notifications that are supposed to happen when they're transporting uh, a marijuana product from the facility between the facility. I'm, uh, I'm unaware of the specifics. For future reports, we'll, we'll uh, include a summary box in here so that we all know. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just to follow up to that, so not commenting on any particular uh, uh, license or, or penalty, but there there could be a perceived, and there has been, I'm sure, in the past, perceived sort of due process concern when we don't take action until much later when we hear through some other venue or the media or whatever, there's a serious violation. And that's sort of what this is, I think, intended to alleviate is that we will be more up to date. And so a violation that occurred two months ago, we could, or I guess three months ago now, we can start to take action on as opposed to when it occurred nine months ago. Um, but this level of specificity isn't, this isn't enough for us to kind of make that decision. So, yeah. um, Could attach to this the actual NOVs? And then that way you have the summary here and yes. flip through and read the actual NOV. It would be good, man, if you do that. Yeah. Because there would be an NOV if it's on this list. You have to go yes. to the violation. And those are, we saw some pretty bad. So how, you know, is it like a two page thing? Or Most of our site got a summary page. I guess I would say, last comment on that. You know, we uh, we have a lot of reading that we have to do, right? We have a lot of work. So for some things that are fairly routine, like at this point, odor violations, I think we know what those are. We've seen those. I wouldn't need, I think for that, I, it's fine. I don't need that. But for things that seem a little bit more novel, like a refusal of inspection or whatever transfer violation is or something like that, those are the ones I kind of want to highlight so we have a sense of what they are. Okay. Felix called me last night. He wants to talk about this odor thing. So just if we're past this and we this sketch here, can we recognize him? Rivera? Uh, yeah. Let's talk about order. Okay. Early, a place he takes the kids, gets you to something with kids every day, takes them down, he walks right through an order cloud. So he wants to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Chris? Um, I think that the standard might be when AMCO is forwarding to the board because they don't even know how to act. But for the short term, I'm sure we can see the newer ones. Like the transfer of license, I don't know what violations would be there. But if AMCO's not dealing with that, they could make it administrative, it seems pretty low grade. Yeah. And there are there are also are things that they have open investigations that they don't notify us of everything that they're doing. So it may be a few months, you know, before they let us know what's going on because if they're compartmentalized to a certain extent. <laughs> just, just to, I mean, to a certain degree, I think it's kind of an irreducible problem that we have this other regulatory agency that is taking on a lot of these roles and sometimes more serious roles, uh, you know, more serious violations. And so I guess for my colleagues, I would just sort of, um, it's just to reiterate the point that sometimes justice takes time. So we will see violations sometimes that are quite old and not to immediately dismiss that as incompetence on the municipality's part or something we shouldn't take action on in the, in the future because you can tell, tell just from the conversation we're having, we're having here, it takes a long time for these things to really come before us. So, I know that was an issue before. One quick thing, yeah. Yeah. But we've had the same problem with forced with alcohol for 10 years. We'll get an alcohol, no violation, that comes up for renewal. The national will have been taken nine months ago. Yeah. So I mean, it's the same problem we have, the same body. But whether it's marijuana or alcohol, it's the same problem. Well, a couple of things jump out here too. Transfer of license. If, that's a, if something was done that's an issue with the state, we don't know how allowed. It could be even more serious in our case. Is that, we have would, you looked at these? We would require the application also. So if there was a transfer that they're, they maybe didn't submit in a timely manner or. I can 
speak to that because I represent all three of these. What happened was um, they were doing a money raise and the attorney on the other side of it didn't understand the marijuana regulations, so she went ahead and filed a notice of change of officials, which changed the ownership, which I was like, Ugh, I can't do that yet. And I had to undo it and then explain it. And so now it's all status quo, and then once the transfer is approved by the control board, which now the application's been submitted, and I'll make sure Kyle sent you guys the muni, but it hasn't been approved yet on the state side. So they just did a, essentially did a transfer that wasn't approved yet. They yeah, did. the other attorney didn't, like she read the rules and she just thought that she could change the ownership without approval, um, which I had to, you know, just undo it. So, lack of communication. So now two have gone to AMCO, so do we just sit still till AMCO's done? kind of talking about timeliness. I mean, if there was something done wrong, we can find out what it is and we can start our process simultaneously. There are not, in Title 10, there are not um, remedies if it's not filed when it should be. It says it needs to be done, but there's not anything written that would be a penalty if it's not. Oh, you're talking about the transfer of license? Yeah. I'm looking at, actually, it's moved on, sorry. Oh. These other ones, sales without uh, marijuana handling. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, well, that's gone to AMCO, but that's an issue with us, too. Should we wait until they resolve it? You might resolve it differently. They might find differently, too. Yeah, well, I haven't received any other information on it. Me? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So my question about the sales without the, the handler permit is what, what what kind of a penalty do we have for a restaurant that operates with an employee that doesn't has to have the food handler's card? What, does anybody know what that is? Because I mean, I would think that it would be more, should be more or less the tab symbol. You didn't have a tabs card would be the same thing. I was to both drugs. You could save that for 2A. Alcohol. 2A? You can have a review of fines. We have touch on that. Okay, anything else on this? Casey's got his Casey. head yeah, over there. If, if I could just um, say, you know, um, this is part of what I discussed with Erica and James Holder um, a couple meetings ago. And um, part of that, when these kinds of sales for uh, marijuana handlers permit, uh, that's why I'd like to see a summary about what that is, because generally what that ends up being is that somebody doesn't have their card on them. It, like, it's like not having a driver's license when a policeman pulls you over because your taillights out kind of thing. And so all, all these people generally get checked, and so what they have asked is that they keep a copy of their marijuana handler's card on file now in all the stores so that they don't end up in that situation. And I, I think that may be what this is, because this was a ways back too, but we had a discussion of, about that at my meeting with uh, James and Erica. So I'd like to see a summary. I don't think that was somebody per se acting like serving food without a, actually being issued a food handler's card kind of thing. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. If we had the NOV that came with this, it would tell us what it is, because I've seen NOVs written that before. Yeah. In many cases, it tells us what the action was taken to correct the problem, so we know if they were going to put the cards on file. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. need to have it. Yeah. Rich and I were just talking past practice with the uh, with alcohol. We've always deferred to the state. When they're taking action, we don't double up on the. They're taking enforcement action. We don't have a double action. I know, but Jack, with alcohol, the state controls it. Here, both the city and the state right. have a co-equal role in it. It's a different process than alcohol. And, and has, has that worked okay, letting the state do it, then we do it? Yes. And the lag's not too long? You better look. We've had, the lag is pretty we've long had long. Long. a little bit number of, year. of cases, but there's, there's been cases where the state pursued enforcement, and there's been cases where we're both aware of it, but they allowed us to pursue the enforcement of uh, uh, Danish Gardens. One example there that we took the action against Danish Gardens in the hearing, and the state basically let us pursue the enforcement, and they didn't pursue the enforcement through the AMCO. Okay, and they could have. Yes. But they just let yes. us do it. Right. Mr. Chair, and I think that um, there have been discussions in the recent past about fairness 
if it's right to have dual processes moving forward in terms of penalties. And so that certainly is something we can discuss under the fine schedule, but it seems there is a reasonable idea to contemplate that we should meet out penalties in relationship to whatever it was, but we should contemplate what the other parties are doing as well. It should be part of the evaluation. Okay. Anything else on this? Thanks. Okay, so next up is review of fines for municipal marijuana licenses. I think is that what that's what these are, doing, right? This, are these under that category? Because we don't have these specifically called out. And, uh, we have transfer of ownership, which I think we will move on from today. This one has a lot of history to it. Usually, inspection is $2,000. Is that what this Well, I think that's part of it. If I might. So, I don't think that it's addressed here specifically, yeah. but we did after the meeting two meetings ago, uh, have a discussion about how we need to ensure that we craft a schedule of penalties that has scalability and uh, multiple potential options in it. Instead of just a death sentence or a massive shutdown, that we should have a reasonable set of alternative penalties as well that get to um, a more effective way to target operators that are failing to meet the mark. And so I don't see here what we have as a standard schedule, and um, I think it's $500 is the maximum penalty on anything we can do, if I'm not mistaken. And so that's the conversation we need to have, and if we don't have something in front of us now, it would be smarter to take up what we do have in front of us and come back to this question a little more prepared. <coughs> well, yeah, I don't see that we're, we have the whole fine schedule. Right. list of everything. But these two do, I think the genesis was a fine for um, refusal of inspection and then we had added some other stuff on. So why don't we go ahead and let Dean go through, uh, we'll call the first one, the one that regards denial of license um, based on previous relocation or non renewal Everybody have that? Single sheet of paper. Well actually that's the one that's the one that's license restrictions on top. Right. Okay. Ironically, the one that says denial of license application is not actually about the license denial of license application. That's the one that changes will to May. Two page one. And then and then does will to May. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then and then does what we talked about with the, the immediate shutdown after and after refusal and inspection. Right. The one that the one that does what you're talking about with previous relocation is the single page. Okay. Okay. Right. So it'd be the single page from that table. Did you want to go through this briefly? Um, yeah. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If you don't mind, I had a couple comments about our recent discussion. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. To and uh, I was just looking up some code. So would you have a, a, a fine for um, transferring without giving consent first? It's $100, and you have that for the marijuana license transfers. Uh, we don't have a specific fine, as Ms. Honest said, for um, not having a handling permit. And it seems like we don't have a general fine for any violation. They just have a specific fine in Title 14. So I think that the, I think we should probably address that and many other um, the give choice schemes, there's a catch all general fine, there was something specified. So, um, would be something to look at. And then, um, Mr. Peterson asked about uh, food handling permits, and uh, there's a $70, $75 fine for that that's administered by DHHS. So, I thought that looking up code when we were discussing it would be helpful. Um, so, uh, talking to this uh, draft ordinance that uh, uh, prohibits issuing a license to someone who had a recent um, revocation of their license or who had a renewal application denied. This is uh, something that I drafted as a result of these proceedings we had, and there was discussion that what's the effect of 
not when you need license. And uh, I didn't have any specific single name one to six up and half of it. Like that was a concern, so that's why I drafted the service. Um, I was working on the other uh, the other document. So this basically um, would actually specify that somebody couldn't obtain the marijuana license if they've had the certification and it's number of years. Uh, it's not necessarily something you have to do. Um, I had talked with um, Tony Becky with Peterson, uh, Pearson, excuse me. Um, basically the application process and the criteria uh, the assembly could deny based on uh, it's not in the best interest of public health, safety, and welfare. And I uh, recently vocation or non renewal and grounds for those could be basis for denying license as not in the best interest of public health, safety, and welfare. So this uh, assemblies could still deny a application for the same reasons that this building makes this group for. This ordinance, this draft, is just making it very specific and required so you can have that discretion to decide um, it's in the public safety, <coughs> health and welfare. If there was a revocation, instead it would be there's revocation, the clerk could say this application can't go forward and it's up to if there were a uh, recent revocation within the past X years. So that would be, I think, the difference here which we can have. Right. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to point out, too, that one of the approval criteria for the special land use permit um, mentions any previous denials or revocations of the license uh, in the past. So if the assembly were to find that the reason for that denial was egregious enough, they could use it as a finding um, to not approve a special land use permit or license based upon this approval criteria. Mr. Chair. So what I'm hearing you say is in some ways this is Tying our hands, but it's redundant because we already have that power in this specific case. Uh, this requires. Dean, Dean might be able to. This requires it, that already we have the power to go on a specific case. Uh, just more for the record, um, Assembly Member Vera has joined us. I think Dean might be able to answer better which one gives more teeth. Um, it's whether not about it more teeth. This one makes it a requirement. What you're saying is we already have the power to do it on the specific case if we choose to. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's thank you. Okay. Um, what what is so if someone's license were revoked and they got it, so they have a functioning operation, we revoke it, they have to stop. So if they went through the process again, if the state didn't revoke their license or we did, how long would it take them to get through the process? Um, if they had, for like a new special land use permit, if, if they were well, to be Well, if we applied. revoke their license and they go, well, shoot, I got all this stuff, then they apply for another one, the same location. Start you over. get another basic start over. Yeah, yeah, from the day an applicant submits complete application to when they're heard by the assembly is approximately 75 days. But that's once they have a full application. To, you know, to find a new location to move their business to and to get all that arranged. Sometimes it takes up to a year, maybe more. Well, presumably they do the same thing. We're talking about the same location. Let's say we shut their business down and take their license away. If they want to come back and have a license at that same location, they wouldn't have to find a new place they could use at that same location, is what we're saying. How long would right. it take to get through the process? Uh, like I said before, 75 days when they got a new application. After the application is deemed. After the application, yeah. well, I would get everything done, Chris. I would. I would presume that they would have everything done because there's quite a lot of paperwork and procedures in going through the process to get an application. Sure, correct. It's not going to take a year. No, I, I, I agree with you there. But it, it, it might depend on when the marijuana control board was meeting. Sometimes they don't meet, you know, weekly or anything. We're not talking about the state license. We're talking about city license. Yeah, but. It, if they lose their license, then they would have to reapply for the state, right? No, we, we, just, we determined that that isn't the case. No, you can have both licenses, you just can't operate without both. The, for example, the state, with our action we took, the state could just do nothing with Ken Alaska's license. The state side, they're fine, but for us, they've got to reapply. They, if it was a different company, they'd have to reapply for the license. Right. Okay, so I mentioned that particular example for a few No, minutes. but just an example. That's true. <coughs> 
so, you know, if you shut one down, they could, you know, they could sell it. Say, I can't operate it. I lost the right to operate it. So presumably, they want to sell the operation to someone, not just back it up. So that new person would need to get a new license. That's it. Yeah. And that would mean going back to the state. Yeah. That's true. So that, that could be. And that would take, could that be a year? They started with the state. Existing location is already functioning. That place lost its license, so a new owner comes in and says, "I want to run this one." It comes to you. I mean, that's a that's a trans that would be a transfer in our office. I, I, I can't even tell you how long that would take. Three to four months. Yeah, a transfer. Back. And, and then you come to the city. And, and then once we get two and a half months. Yeah, once we got deemed completed. So potentially, if someone got shut down, if we did nothing, we had no rule here, you're talking two and a half to seven months that they're shut down anyway, just get things sorted out. Is that about right? Jen's not even. Yeah. Andy? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. So this, I mean, this did come out in recent discussions. You know, what if we take it away? How can they apply right away? That was part of our discussion. That was the genesis of this. You don't remember who said that, by Mr. Crawford. So, so any, do we move forward on something like this, or what would you like to do? Chris? I think that we don't need to tie our hands, that we must do this in this way. We have the flexibility already under the code to achieve this in a specific manner. So uh, that would be my recommendation, no, but I understand that my recommendation in these questions has been called suspect by some members who have said I'm in the pocket of the industry, which I reject. Um, it looks more like it. Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Pete, <clears throat> thoughts? Um, well, so I'm just wondering, that number four at the bottom of the first page, mm -hmm. where it says, Double access that that doesn't mean 20 years, does it? No, we just have to blanks. Okay, and if this has been there, how long would it Ro be? Roman, Roman numerals that would be 20 mean. years, so I just just <laughs> thought I would clarify that. Time for personal growth and maturity. There's other there's other things in our code where you have a delay if you're not approved for something. Yeah, wait, isn't there? It's, it's, well, it seems like we've seen this. I've seen We've had some alcohol where they got to correct the problem in getting to the first office and the first level before it to the end corridor. You know, when we've got some sort of a protest on the liquor license, mm -hmm. once they cure the problem, they get over the first office and they can go right to the end corridor. We do that routinely. Dean, is there anywhere else in our code where if they apply, you get rejected, they have to, like a rezone? Isn't it if you fail a rezone? There, there is. Um, I can look up to see if you're uh, interested in exact requirement, but, but there is. But there is a delay. Yeah. Okay. So this isn't totally making sense. Yes. Okay. Oh. What do we do with this? I, I, I I'm sorry. Uh, no question. Uh, we first looked up Becky Lynn Pearson. Uh, the special land use permit for marijuana. If your application is denied, you can't apply for it. You know, and uh, then also, uh, you know, from with Title 11 taxi cab and chauffeur's licenses, if you've got a revocation, you've got a time period before you can apply again. So um, there are some other comparable provisions, I suppose. Uh, I could look more about the rest of the Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend not going forward with this at this time. And, and the reason is because I think looking at sort of the totality of our marijuana laws right now, what Chris identified, I think, is a real problem where we don't seem to have much in between the death penalty and relatively low fines for an operation that could be making thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars a day, $500 isn't very much. At the same time, uh, you know, closing them for six months or more is, is, um, is really significant. So what we're trying to do is find um, that sort of spectrum of justice in between it. This, to me, seems like on the far end, adding something additional, and, and sort of additional sort of collateral consequence 
that um, I don't think we really need, given that we have the flexibility and how difficult it is to actually apply for a marijuana license and go through the process right now. Um, you know, I certainly haven't heard from anybody in the industry that's like, you know what, it's too easy to get a license. Like it's, <laughs> it's been, you know, there aren't enough restrictions. So um, for me, I, I, I don't think this is necessary at this time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We can just let it go, huh? Okay, let's park this one now. Any thoughts from the industry, Jan, you want to push your forward? Um, I think we should park it just because I need to, I haven't, I don't think we're there yet on like a thought process of it, so maybe we could come back to it in like two weeks or a week. So the general provisions of Title Ten for licensing does allow any applicant to reapply immediately um, for like the business licenses. So if they've been denied an or if their application has been denied for any reason, they can reapply immediately. Um, so that kind of covers all of the Title Ten, which would include the marijuana licenses. And so there's a thinking on that that if they made a mistake, they got denied a mistake, well, shoot, we can fix that. They go back, fix that, bring a new application. Yeah. Has anyone, has that happened? Um, no. No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. We've, had, no. we've had applications denied and we've had people come back later, a few months or a year or two later and apply again, but none have just turned around and reapplied. Oh, the way this is drafted, it was so specific as to um, denying an application based on an annual, uh, um, a renewal being denied on two specific grounds. So if it were taxes or some error in the application, that's not a good year in this draft. If you just need to pay your tax and come back and apply again, that's not going to prevent that application. Which is good. Talk about page five A B. Being kind of specific. The reason for non removal, you know, not in the best interest in the public, or uh, violating conditions or restrictions, and a lot like other reasons in there. The application is not correct information or not pay taxes. So not making bar. Anyways, just wanted to make that. Distinction that this was trying to be narrow. All right, thank you. Anything else on that? Okay, the second one regarding uh, primarily refusal of inspection. Can you run through that, Dean? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a copy of so. What's your name? I got it. You got a copy? Yeah. Um, so the first section, this is basically two pieces to this ordinance. The first section changes the word uh, well to nay in the uh, denial of license application. So 1080-80A is for an initial application, and B is for a new application, and C is for a transfer of an interest application. And basically, uh, I think Mr. Croft and maybe another assembly member had said, uh, me. Had said that the well locks you in to saying you have to, you know, Mr. Constant, maybe Mr. Dumbledore. This locks the assembly in to saying you well deny an application of this grounds of love. So I guess we recognize an issue where there's like a minor violation that was usually correctable and not really significant. But this says you well deny there's a violation of the code. So um, that can be problematic. It takes your discretion away. So all this does is leave the discretion to the assembly. We can weigh the gravity, the magnitude of their behavior or conduct the violation, and you may deny that you don't have to. That's what the effect is intended to be here. Uh, and then the second part, uh, we've had requests from now Mr. Constance and others as well to uh, be able to shut down operations. Uh, that's on top of page three in paragraph C. Um, I, I guess. On page two, I just tried to uh, condense this long list of who may enforce provisions to say Mr. Professor, that's all that is. So, subsection C, top of page three. Some of this language is modeled after a uh, language that exists in 
a few different provisions of Title 21 for stop work orders, and we have this in Title 23 in the past. The thing was changed now, but um, so stop work orders are something that are in our code in other contexts, and this is basically just saying um, if a respect an inspection is refused, uh, the municipal official can issue a suspend operations order and um, serve it on whoever is the responsible management facility and post it on the main entrance. And uh, again, though, the enforcement officers are there to do any physical force type of activity, between an order and stuff. So the next part is violations of not only uh, if using the inspection, which they're supposed to cooperate with the equipment code, but also by giving a suspend operations order. So, um, so this was uh, my first draft at trying to do this with the language carefully. I've tried to leave some discretion in the last two sentences. For the municipal official, he does the posting to um, allow some sort of operation to continue. If it's a cultivation facility, manufacturing facility, maybe you've got processes there that need somebody to actually be on site for safety or to take care of the product and inventory that, you know, cease operations otherwise. So the municipal official just postings to make that call as to what limited activity would be allowed otherwise. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chris? So I had asked for another element to be included, and that was and I don't know if this is legal, but to be immediately scheduled for a suspension and revocation hearing. Um, I mean, if what? If sorry. they refuse an inspection, it's a big fine and an immediate date with us to talk about losing your license. Okay. So you you bypass the accusation process? No, it would be it would be the activation <coughs> process would in fact be you have failed to let us in yeah. no what I'm saying is you, and now we're going to investigate the I'm not I'm not criticizing you I'm just saying you know right now we have a process where a specific assembly member has to make an accusation and if we were to write the code in that way then you wouldn't have the to action that. of suspending or refusing the inspection is in fact the thing that sparks the process for right. suspension revocation because this is so serious you know, if, if someone is going to say, no, you can't come in, that is, as we have seen in the proceedings that we've had before us recently, enough to take it to the very extreme penalties we can think of. And so I think that people need to be on those. $2,000 isn't enough. I think it should be, not only are you immediately shut down, but you are also immediately scheduled for a hearing. Okay, Chris, but what about the hearing officer's role in this? Are you saying you didn't immediately go to the Assembly bypass hearing officer? There isn't a hearing officer determination on a refusal to inspect. The refusal to inspect is a different procedure. It's not it's not a question of Can we get Jack yeah. on this? Yeah. The, the fines would be put under the hearing officer. The fines would be but yeah. this penalty Sorry. if you're telling us we can't come in, that just immediately alludes to a major violation. We we talked about uh, this is the one section that we were concerned with, and we were going to recommend five thousand dollars fine and Whoa. immediate uh, initiation of suspension proceedings, mm -hmm. because it's just it is so in our, in our opinion it is so serious that we don't want it to ever happen, ever. And, it, and it probably won't, but it, the, the the consequences need to be severe. immediate, swift, and severe, so that uh, yeah. <coughs> And the reasoning is that if somebody's denying us an inspection, something's going on. Something's up. Something's going on. Yep. They're hiding. So. Okay. Um, I really like how, how Dean's crafted this. This is I like the the uh, immediate stop work and 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 also the flexibility of specifically what he's talking about. Maybe the cultivation, just like keeping the plants alive, et cetera. That would absolutely go on it. And this gives you the flexibility I, to I leave people so. there for security, yeah. for keeping plans going. It, it, it appears to. Okay. Yeah, so some specific thoughts on this yeah. section. So I, I think that as it's written now, you could imagine a situation where they refused inspection and, you know, then resolved whatever, this is a hypothetical, you know, resolved whatever nefarious activity they were up to. And then the next day said, okay, come, come on back. And they did, and they were like, we'll pay our $2,000 fine. That was better than we would have paid. 
right? But, um, and so I, I agree with Chris that we need some other um, mechanism to keep it closed for a, for a certain amount of time. Um, so that they can't do that. And I, I actually like the idea of a suspension of revocation hearing be the, the, the what happens. Um, and I think if we did with that route, though, I don't think we need to go up to a $5,000 fine because if you were to have a $2,000 but they have to wait for a suspension of revocation hearing, well, that might take us a week, you know, or at least a few days, and they're going to be losing revenue that entire time, presumably. Um, and, and so I, I and, and, you know, once you're in front of us for a suspension of revocation hearing, that's a very serious deal. So uh, for me, I would add something like what Chris said, but then recommend we keep it at two thousand dollars <coughs> rather than up at the five thousand. Um, so Jack, you spoke to. Um, I do have a quick. What what um, what's the fine for like a stop work order for construction? There's well. It depends on what other underlying violations are. For the actual the stop work order itself, there, there's not a fine for a stop work order. On a construction job, if you shut down a crew, that's <laughs> similar to a business. You shut down a crew, yeah. and you have all the all the all your construction equipment standing by. You got a crew go to the house. It's it's thousands of dollars worth of essentially that is a fine. And I, I'm sorry, as someone in Denmark, I yeah, I understand what you're. What you're saying about the uh, loss of revenue, too, very similar. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And just for uh, informational purposes, I was looking up fines uh, yesterday, and uh, $2,000 is the maximum fine for a, a Class B misdemeanor. <coughs> so, just so you know where approximately we are as far as other criminal penalties are concerned. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, How much time, Chris, are you talking about for a hearing to happen in front of the assembly? So, I think you, I had actually envisioned it slightly differently. Um, what I had imagined is they are immediately shut down, and as soon as they allow the inspection, they're allowed to open. Not hold it closed until such a time as we hold a hearing. But instead, what happens, how I envision it is they refuse the inspection, for whatever reason, and then even half an hour later, they allow it. Fine, you can open up again. We've inspected. We've done what we need to do. But you're still coming before us within the next whatever frame time it takes to schedule a hearing. I, I wouldn't imagine we need to say this is going to happen tomorrow or within the week. I think we just schedule it in the normal order of how we do business. But it is the official revocation proceedings or suspension proceedings because that allows us an unlimited array of responses, uh, fines and fees and penalties that are not allowed under the licensing plan. Of course. So how do we stop? I mean, so now what we've done, essentially, even though we've raised the, the fine, we've basically given them a process to sort of formally do what maybe only informally they could have done before, which is, okay, I'm going to refuse you, I'm going to pay my fine, in the next several hours, I'm going to destroy whatever evidence you would have found, and then I'm going to invite you back. Well, we shut them down. But only for those few hours in your, in your... We immediately go in. Whatever it is, ideally, they will figure it out. That's the whole point of the inspector. Mm -hmm. So you're saying they refuse, and then we shut them down and inspect them anyway? I don't think that's how it works. Yeah, we shut them down until they allow the inspection. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the action that we're aiming for is to be allowed in immediately without change of the site or scene yeah. until such a time that our people with badges are in there investigating what happened, how whatever they were aiming to see and whatever they might stumble upon. And right, the facts aren't going to change then if they finally go in and inspect and then relinquish the scene. Between that time and when we hear it. Oh, I see what you mean. So if we were to close their doors for like say a week waiting for the assembly, and our insulin inspectors couldn't have gone in there even if Well, they could have, but it wouldn't have, there's no change. Once they've left, once the inspection has happened, they have secured the scene and made violation notices, whatever they have found or not found. That's the, to me, that that's one procedure. Then scheduling the immediate hearing for suspension or revocation is just, because if you told us we can't come in, then we are going to presume you're doing something major. Okay, I got a number of the cube that I want to go to. Um, 
maybe Jack, can you comment on that? If um, you know, if you cleared everyone out so they can't hide the evidence, do you, after refusal of inspection, can you get a warrant then or something so then you can go in and do the inspection you need to do? Is there a process there? We can always request an administrative search warrant. I'm just still trying to wrap my brain around the. You get to. I'm still trying to understand it right now. Sure. Yeah. How long does it take to get an administrative search warrant? Depends off the judges available. If you have, um, it's still probably a minimum half a day. I would think. Then it's going to be a week. Exactly. No. Good time, of course. At least from what I've seen in our office, it's rarely. Rarely ever. I mean, like, I've done half a dozen in all my years here. Yeah, yeah. in the eight years I've been here, I know one, and that was the Northern Lights yeah. Hotel. And it was, I mean, the judge was fine with it, but it was yeah. kind of like everybody's like, oh, this is different because mm -hmm. they're used to criminal search warrants, not right. administrative. So it, it wouldn't be a quickie thing either. That's the way uh, criminal search warrants are that happen all the time. Thanks, they stop. No, of course. The, um, for the administrative search warrant, what's the do you need probable cause, or could could the refusal of the inspection be enough evidence yes, in and of itself? Absolutely. Okay, so you don't yeah, need that's any another additional. Municipal, that's another municipal code, so twenty three, et cetera. That, okay. Yeah, that's that's the that's the route we take. Okay, let me challenge the patient here. Um, just a, a couple of things. I think um, Dean, you should consider maybe um, for A one, including waste storage and disposal area and licensed premises, because while it, it just would clear up some things that wherever the waste is being stored, it is part of the inspection area. Um, and then with the closure notice, if somebody refuses entry and refuses an inspection, I think the closure notice, you might want to consider adding um, that that's an immediate request for the last 40 days of video from whatever the date is that you have your revocation hearing so that like last time we didn't get those video well I don't want to talk about last time but you know you need the video and if you wait too long 40 days might pass and blah blah, blah. so just an immediate request for video um, up until the revocation day hearing um, and then B2 providing access to business records so I think it's if Rich shows up to a shop and the owner's not there and Rich says, I want to see your QuickBooks, that's a totally reasonable request, but the employee probably wouldn't be able to comply. So maybe there should be some kind of language that for number two, that you know, if, if you can't get the business records within 24 hours, maybe that's a refusal of inspection, but, but I, I mean, my employees wouldn't have access to that information. I can't imagine many folks would allow their employees to do that. that that's all I have. All right, yeah, that's good, thank you. Okay. Dean, on back to the issue of a fine, they've got $2,000, and some people suggested $5,000. How high can we go, Dean? Do you know? <laughs> there is no. Is there um, a For civil fines, um, I can't really say <laughs> what the size can, can go. Oh, well, Jack was saying. 2000 is hard, but as a whole rule, municipality, you're not limited by some restrictions in state law that apply to the municipalities. So, as a super <coughs> fine, um, 2000 is at the high end of what we've seen, but there's some other code provisions that have a 5000 super fine. I think it's for like hindering the ombudsman or something like that. So, um, you could go higher. But I don't see anything entitled for civil fines above 5,000. I think that's the highest I've seen. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I don't know if we have further materials. Uh, if I may add something about the um, idea to uh, immediately go to a uh, suspension, revocation, proceeding, accusation. Um, I think there's due process issue with doing immediate revocation proceeding, but not so much with an immediate suspension proceeding. But right now, there is a summary suspension proceeding in Title 10, a few sections after the spring. And it says the municipal clerk may uh, immediately suspend the license and uh, require the operations to cease. And that's discretionary, and that already exists. So you could have this inspection refusal, and uh, if the municipal clerk, depending on the circumstances, says, well, well that's pretty serious. I mean, there's some. Uh, 
uh, the charity activity going on, trying to destroy evidence and all that. They can do the immediate um, suspension already. It's, that authority already exists. If you want to put language in here that requires it, I think that could be problematic in terms of, well, an inspection is refused, but what's on um, what basis? And waste disposal or inventory may be serious, but a business records refusal is not as serious. So if you take away this question and make it mandatory, I can see some circumstances where that would be, um, wouldn't be seen appropriate to require an immediate uh, suspension proceeding. So um, I think that we uh, have adequate language right now, although <laughs> it's in a different section. You could tie it in and out a sentence that says, um, and some clerk may start suspension proceedings in accordance with the other section where that discretion is already provided. I, I just want to make clear is that you're just making a distinction between um, the suspension hearing and the stop work. So the stop work order could be immediate, but then the suspension hearing needs to have a delay or, or some discretion to process. Uh, we have this, uh, well, I called it the suspend operations order. It's, I guess, uh, stop work is another context in construction and the construction sense. So um, the suspend operations order that is in this draft is only for, for specific reasons to move includes open inspection. Uh, the summary suspension of a license could be for a number of other, any reason. It doesn't have specific reasons you could use that uh, summary suspension process in this clerk, so. Okay, Pete? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I know we need to continue this discussion, but realistically it, it makes a little sense for a licensee to refuse an inspection because there's cameras everywhere and they have to keep the film for 40 days. And like Jenna mentioned earlier, they can go in and look at the film to see what violation they were trying to hide or whatever. And I, and I think because of the uh, publicity of, uh, of the, the licensee that went through the process we had a couple of weeks ago, I, I don't think there's any license either are going to want to go through that themselves. So I, I don't foresee a need for this very much, to tell you the truth. I, I think they've probably uh, um, been scared straight as the old movie title. Thanks. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I have a few things. Um, the what is the state time requirement for production of financial resources? So if it's less than six months old, it's supposed to be immediately available on site during reasonable <coughs> regular business hours. But if it's less, if it's more than six months old, it's three days, three days. So we might, for the purposes of looking at that section B, if we move forward this on business records, parallel the state's time requirements. That way we um, have a procedure that is useful to them and to us. So there's that. Then uh, one of the rationales for moving toward an immediate uh, revocation suspension hearing, and I don't mean immediate in terms of right now or within the next 24 hours. What I mean by immediate is the scheduling of the procedure, whatever the due process rules are for that procedure, which might mean three weeks, might mean many steps that have to be accomplished, but this is a trigger for that process is what I'm imagining, not so much a jump to the end of that process, but a trigger for the beginning of that process, which again comes back to why I would argue we wouldn't hold them closed until such time as the proceeding has occurred. We would hold them closed only until such time as the inspection occurred, right? Because the inspection is the crucial action here that's being refused. And so the idea is, and, and I, I agree that right now, a refusal to inspect is very likely not to happen. But what happens over time is people forget. And we won't be here, and they won't be here, and they've already flown off on their jet to wherever because they made so much money. And then their set of cameras aren't working anymore, right? There's a whole set of cameras that are just broken. Oh my god. So then what they're going to get is a penalty for not having their camera system in operation, another $500. 
but that's it. And so it seems to me that if we put in a trigger here that just defaults to whatever the due process right is, but we immediately begin countering that process, we leave in the code a memory of what we've just gone through that any future body or applicant or operator will recognize. All right, thanks. Uh, Jenny, you had to Oh, I was just going to say, uh, um, and I apologize, I did make this big packet for odor stuff from other jurisdictions, but it didn't get through the email system um, uh, last night, so hopefully I can get it to you guys and you can look at it. But there is, Denver has this uh, cool thing where they have a point system for fines, so like if you conceal evidence, there you get a, a lot of points and it ups your fine schedule. Um, so that's something maybe to consider, and if you don't conceal it and you're totally open and honest and you get zero points so that lowers your fine amount and there's this all these different fine plus points so it's a whole little matrix um, that Denver's been doing so I'll um I'll shoot that out and you know I actually don't even think I included it in this packet because I was like looking for it but I'll attach the packet and then re-send it out um, to Mr. Orlton. All right thanks. Okay. I'd like to see this thing go forward in the body for us to discuss it there and use another workstation on for the whole body see how we can craft this before we get to this stuff. But you know, Pete was talking about people's memory gets short. Let's say you've got an individual that has a facility, has a garbage can, our inspectors go, they can't open it up. All of a sudden, it's now open and the product is taken out. You'll never know it was in those bags. And I want to make sure that never happens in this town. I want, and I want Jack and those people to know who to support them. They're doing what we asked them to do, to do the inspections. So I want to put a real hammer out there in case this ever happens again. Thanks, John. All right, thanks. Uh, I have a question for Dean. So on the first line of C, if inspection or access under subsection B is denied, and it doesn't say who denies, I think this gets back a little bit to what Jan was saying, well, they don't have access to QuickBooks or whatever, or, or the details of the measures and so on. Um, certainly if it was denied by you know, an owner, a license, someone on the license, raise the amount. But it fits a uh, somebody's just staff there. Goes, I don't know anything about that. I can't let you in that office or whatever. That's it. Do you, you must deal with that. How, how do you handle that? So can we put words in here that clarify, or do you have ways of dealing with that already? I was looking at the, the, the responsible manager or licensee or licensee's agent. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that that would have to be defined in here as well. Because when we get to hearing. Every, every time we go to the hearings officer, we're burning many, many, many hours of preparation and then the actual hearing itself and then trying to educate the hearing officer on what the code, new or old, actually says. And then words like these, which are well-intentioned and, and can be defined, but they're exactly right. So we just have a, a person, that's an HS, that's a poor term, I'm sorry. We have a, uh, an employee who's working as the, the public counter in a business and that's who's representative at that time. But are they a member responsible manager or, or an agent, et cetera? Well, if we define it as that, then, then sure. But, uh, so do we even get, you actually get proper service on the right person with this? Were, were you a responsible, were you a manager? Yes, were you a responsible manager? Well, I don't know. So it's, 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 it's really, it, it may seem like it's nitpicky, but that's, that's our world we live in. And it takes hours and hours and hours of prep and then Jen, Jen, Jen can say, yeah, Russ, you know, it's, it's a lot of hours and a lot of money. And we want to do the right thing. We want to enforce the code. We want these businesses to run correctly. But the cumulative effect of these things is really takes a lot of time. So can you recommend wording there? Sure, we can, yeah, we, can, we can look at this and come back and say, sure, absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah, for, the, for that particular sentence, we're just talking about service of the, uh, of the order. So I think you just change responsible manager to employee mm -hmm. because every through was a respondent superior is that the right term? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it is. It's you are responsible for the actions of your employees. So right. you can be your employees can be served something that is intended for you in, in, in your business operations. If I go to your clerk, your clerk should give it to you. It doesn't need to go to your manager. That would be that would no. be good service in yeah, the yeah, under state law. That would be. Yeah. It wouldn't be good service. No, okay. it has to be so one thing that we could do though is do like um, a sh maybe a sheet that you have to do with your special land use permit that says 
you know, um, obviously all the licensees could be good service, but also if there's a designated general manager, put that person's name in contact, or even like their um, my statutory agent, even like their statutory agent is a good person for service. It has to, according to state law, it has to be either uh, an agent or an officer right, to be in service. In the business. Gotcha. And then AMCO uses the term designated licensee, not primary licensee. So that's an easy easy fix, and that's a defined term. Um, and designate licensee is like the main licensee of who you're supposed to, who they communicate with. But, um, so, so, it, um, so, so if some of these places have 20 licensees, there's certain, you say designated, there's like one who's There's one that's designated, designated who's supposed to um, be the same designated person on all the form submissions. That's the point of contact. Yeah. And that's, we have that on our slot. Are, are they, so if a manager is also on the slot, we've seen that, right? So for the licensing purposes, we get the application of the state and the point of contact from the state. I kind of verify as the same point of contact that filled out the municipal application and make sure that that's the one that we send correspondence to. So whatever email has been um, submitted with the application is what our point of contact is. Managers come and go. Are they updating all this information? So the managers change. There's two types of managers. There's the regular general manager, like of a store. But then there's also, if you're a limited liability company that is set up as a manager managed LLC, you have managers in that sense, and those managers have to be licensees, um, and they're also officials, you know, officers of the company. Okay. Uh, Pete. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I think this is an important point because if we, if we uh, look at what's happening in other jurisdictions in this uh, business, there's a consolidation going on. And so you may have a licensee, but he, ha he maybe owns eight or 10 or 12 locations. And so he's not gonna be present in very many of those very often. So I, I think it's important that we have someone designated if we figure out how, who that might be. Thank you. Well, but the, the intention of this section is to give our inspectors sort of immediate power to close things down. And I'm wondering if, as Pete just said, there's a good chance that there isn't going to be a, uh, a, a you know, the licensee or the legal uh, manager, LLC manager there. So does, does it constrain us? Or is the idea they, they can shut it down and then um, you know, the service could happen sometime later because it might take them a while to track down this person. That's what I thought we were discussing was that it was kind of like a health and safety concern, immediately shut it down, stop operations, and then service the proper legal person. I don't know. That's sure, as long as we do fine, that would work. Yeah. 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 Is it possible, John, to have Jack and Jenna and Dean get together? And I bring this back at our next meeting with some definitions on here. It's what we're looking for responsible person. Because I hate making sausage here in this body. Well, I think that's what this is the first shot at it for this discussion. I think this is but if we can get the three together, Ryan, right, it would be fun. I think, I think they should also work on the language if they decide to do this um, that we talked about at the very beginning. Because I do think it's important that. Um, we close the premise, and it says, right now it says, you know, stop all work and operations. But I think we, for cultivation in particular, you don't want to do that. we want to give them the ability to do the sort of securing operations. So like, or fertilizing, or anything else you got to do. Whatever it is, so that, you know, for manufacturing, probably some kind of safety stuff. For the cultivation, some sort of. So I would suggest that might not be wise here in that, the whole point of this action is to immediately open those doors up for inspection, period, full stop, right? And so if, in fact, you have an operation that is going to filibuster and say, we can't actually, but we need time to keep our plants alive long enough that you are going to get the right person in the room, it kind of defies the whole idea of what we're aiming to do, right? And so I, I would recommend that in this case, we create a really solid hammer that we never have to use because it is so so harmful, right? 
that's the whole idea here. It's not, in fact, to allow them to work around it, but in fact to say, look, this can never happen ever again in Anchorage, Alaska. Did you ever show here for a $5,000 fine? It doesn't no. matter. What I'm Sorry. really for is the immediate hearing for revocation and suspension, which allows any number of penalties, but also creates a true process for them to know this is it. You do this, you're done. Amen. Um, so a question for Jana. If there was a refusal of inspection, the um, enforcement agency was able to shut down the facility immediately and had something like 48 hours to contact the designated licensee or whoever to serve, mm -hmm. would 24 or 48 hours kill a facility if they couldn't go in for 24 hours? The plants should be okay for that long or no? No, well, because the plants are on 12-hour light cycles. Okay. So it's like 12 on, 12 off. Uh, a lot of places have timers that they could set their timers. Um, not sure you know it would be pretty difficult to, to make that work and be okay again the video request would be a good one just mm -hmm. being able to get into their videos um and a lot of them have you know a portal online that you could actually maybe request their login info and mm -hmm. see it real time oh, go ahead Jeff. i think the language dean has here really provides us, us the, except as authorized by the municipal, the municipal official, I think that's that's key. That allows that allows us to make the judgment decision on scene. But I'm gonna tell you what my experience with stop work orders, and I've done an awful lot of them. It's not a 48 hour type situation. Somebody's on the phone right now. You shut their, stop their, their, their job or their business, you're gonna get reaction and it, it's, it's quick. And that comes to my point, Mr. Chair, that I don't know any business that has um, strict requirements that they operate under. I think of where I work, we have Medicaid billing issues and we have human beings that we're responsible for their safety. And it, there is never a moment when there isn't a designated authority available. And so when the CEO is gone for whatever reason, even just out of state or out of town, maybe even still working, there's a designated alternate, period, full stop, in the operating plan. And so there is a way to make it so there's always someone available and no excuse for not being willing to do the job that needs to be done. And so I don't see why this business is any different than any other business that has always responsibility for their operation. Well, that's what I was saying, that form would be a good idea, kind of like we do with the county councils where we designate the owner and then a lot of times, like I'm secondary person to contact if there's an issue, um, something like that, some kind of form that's like, this person, if not this person, this person, if not this person, this person. And, and I, I agree with that. It's just that the elements of proof when you're at hearing is, is these definitions become critical. Mm -hmm. And you just, there's just no way to prove it if, if we don't define who the responsible person is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to move on, I think we've had great information. So we're going to uh, keep working on this. The dean and whoever you need. Coordination exactly. Yeah. Some so, and I think some of the things that came up. So you look at um, um, in cases where the stop work if it regards business records, maybe have some time where there's no employee on site typically who can access them, and maybe parallel the AMCO requirements on that. And then inspection is denied. Kind of clarify it, right? Who would deny the inspection? Maybe an issue, and then clarify. And so I guess that's what Jack's saying is making very clear. And then who was served? Uh, clarify who served as the spent operations order. Uh, add an immediate request for video, um, and then um, possibly add. I mean, maybe you don't need it. You know, who would be allowed to stay for cultivation or any other security and so on. Need more definition on that. And discuss that, and then some wording on start immediately start the suspension process. It's kind of what we're looking at, so that would be a trigger. I'll go through that. Maybe we can be writing this down. We can listen to this or listen to the hearing. Um, and then this does say um, they're suspended until inspection is conducted. I don't know, are we landing there? So you could say stop work order, and then. 
owner comes up and says, okay, we can, it can be an hour later, right? And is that workable? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to have to think. Okay, that. so I might consider that. I mean, is it, because that's the way it's stated here. So mm -hmm. Stop until you can inspect. Right. Is there anything else? No, it's not stop until you can inspect. It's stop until inspection is complete. Right. Right. Because if you stop until you can't inspect, the same thing happens that happened now. The trash is suddenly dumped without getting the detail, and then you're fine. Okay. Good, good sense of that one. Yeah. Okay. Do we want to retain that? I do. Leave it to Jack. Okay. This Who wants that to be over? Is there anything else that I missed? Of course. No, I think that, that sounds good to me. Oh, and, and add on that list of people that, that was a statutory agent, that means they're attorney? Most of the time it's their attorney. Okay. Um, and then I guess we'll leave the dollar fine. That's something to discuss. We can discuss them. Right. So I just want Dean to look to see if it's appropriate given the other clients we have. Okay. And Janet will send us a point system, which might be a bigger, yeah, bigger yeah. separate issue. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? That actually gets to the question that's on the agenda. Um, so I wanted to ask, and maybe Dean can answer this, if we did the service notice of the closure, could you include that the notice of the revocation was going to be at the next um, at the next regularly scheduled assembly meeting or something like that, so they get that notice immediately also? Because I think that would help, because they do need that notice, and if it was one notice that gave both the closure and the initiation of the revocation process. Well, if we got notice of it, um, it's almost, I think, what we're driving at almost here is start that suspension process right away. So mm -hmm. the next meeting you have on our agenda, like to whatever the ordinance or resolution would be ready to go at that meeting rather than, otherwise you'd say, okay, this happened, then what, two weeks later mm -hmm. we can do that. I think what we're looking at potentially is right away. Mm -hmm. there. But this way, yeah. yeah, so this way the applicant or the designated licensee or whoever would have that notice immediately that this process was starting. So right. kind of like the due process notice for them that not only is your facility being closed until an inspection is completed, but you're now noticed that you are scheduled for a, um, initiated you know, the initiation of the revocation process. So they get that right. that well advanced notice that that's what's happening. And the latest where we would learn would be it would be on our in our packet the Wednesday before the meeting and we see it, you know, it's on our plate. Right. Yeah. Again, I think it would go as a, on the notice of violation. For this yeah. violation there would be a special <laughs> section that states yes. exactly that. And that they are in fact if you refuse this inspection you are immediately scheduled, and that's that can, I think, achieve that notification. But this will have to be between the attorneys and the code enforcement people. But I think it's right on that form, their handwriting. Right. Okay, John, do you want to spe do you want to say special regular Sunday meeting or the next available Sunday meeting? Because in the summertime, sometimes we don't meet for three weeks, it's not every two weeks. So, at an assembly meeting, at an assembly meeting. I'm, I'm just saying, when you add yeah. words into there, they have meeting. When do we get three weeks? In the summertime, usually we do take three weeks off. Um, just for some clarification on uh, the different processes, if it's an immediate summary suspension of the license, uh, the code currently 1088.25 says that the clerk, you know, immediately after serves the uh, licensee, but then it also goes to the administrative hearing officer. So to hear the reasons and grounds for the um, summary suspension, the immediate suspension, so that doesn't come directly to the assembly, it goes directly to the administrative hearing officer. But then the accusation for the um, usual at, um, a suspension or revocation process is an accusation in front of the assembly, the assembly can consider those. So um, just so you get, uh, I guess, listening to the discussion, I guess uh, it's in, we're under the impression that an immediate suspension would come straight to the assembly. That's not the case here, uh, the way the code reads. 
So you have the immediate suspension come to the administrative hearing office, perhaps uphold the immediate suspension and so forth. You could then, of course, dovetail into the accusation for the long-term uh, permanent suspension of the location process with an accusation, and that would go to the assembly next. So, How long does the administrative hearing officer take? <laughs> It takes a while. I mean, yeah. we have to. Yeah, it. there's there's a well, there's a 15 day window mm -hmm. to file to, to file an appeal for. Um, and then can't it not be scheduled within? Generally, she has a schedule within two she days. She has yeah. a time. Yeah, she has a time limit. 21 days. Yeah. 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 So that's what she's uh, about to well, the code language on the summer suspension says it goes for an expedited hearing before oh. the administrative code officer. So I don't know if the uh, Title 14 has an expedited schedule for uh, the AHO. Do they have an expedited? I don't know. I mean, we don't know how to do 15 days is the usual. Yeah. I don't know if they have a shorter time. Okay, but we can overlap them. We can go to hearing officer and we can also, just to keep it speed. I think we're talking about different things here. So I think what we're talking about granting code enforcement the authority to stop the operation from happening. And then this other alternate that's already allowed, which is the administrative suspension, is a totally different thing that's already in the code, separate from the conversation we're having. So we don't want to get confused on that. What we're talking about now is allowing the immediate closure until inspection and then scheduling making the accusation built into the refusal. And so that's one procedure. I think that if we get bogged down into the conversation of what happens with the administrative suspension, that's not part of this, and it doesn't need to be part of this. And in fact, it just creates a, a, a hook that takes the proceeding off the table or you know into someone else's hands. And so I would recommend that for the purposes of this, we don't even reference the administrative suspension we give them the power to close them until the inspection happens, and then we immediately calendar the conversation about whatever due process rights are allowed for the licensee if they refuse. I mean, so, but also when we go to the administrator hearing office, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. But we could, at our hearing, we could us, we could say, let's send it there, and then we could postpone action if we felt. Under the, the rules that I understand for uh, termination or excuse me a suspension or revocation hearing we can opt to go to the administrative hearing officer fully separate process however we engage that it's ours to determine under the law and the rules but the administrative suspension that Dean brings up that we already have the power to do is not part of this conversation it's it's really I would suggest a distraction from what we're doing here okay so we got a plan yeah I was just saying we should probably add Reinspection fee. So if you're having the enforcement come back, don't we have reinspection fees? So that we, we do, right? So, right? Yeah. So add that onto a little chart. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they, they do that in the food code when okay. they have to go back to inspectors and additional. Yep. Okay, so when do you want it? Are we going to be ready next meeting? A couple weeks? Or? Is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll look at this again next week. Sure. Oh, MCB. MCB hearing is next week, that week. Um, so I won't be here. I Actually, no, that's right, won't we? By the, eight, by the 18th? Yeah. Is it Thursday, right? Yeah, we'll be back. Isn't that Wednesday, Thursday, 16th, 17th? That's Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, that's good for me. Okay. Jeff, you got AMCO's scheduling meetings on top of this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, the 17th is a uh, state holiday. And the 18th is a state holiday. Uh, Thursday is a state holiday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Raise the table for us. Okay. Huh. Thank you. So that was A. <laughs> now we have a few short minutes to do. B, C, and 3A. Let me bounce a bit. Three A on transfer of ownership. We looked at this in May and June and had actually made a lot of progress. And we were thinking, generally landed that we could be in a position where 
we don't create a value for them like we do with the taxi liquor licenses that also allow transfer to get closer to where the state is. I think that's where we landed. Um, Dean had a good presentation on that, so we just don't have that written up yet. So we want to postpone that also to the next meeting. Can I just quickly speak on that? So last night at the Downtown Community Council, I was just raked over the coals. There is a faction that is really interested in limiting the number of licenses in the muni and uh, putting on a moratorium. So just FYI, that conversation is uh, pretty aggressive and uh, people should be aware. Who is that for? A number of people. Are they, are they all persuaded by the argument that in every industry that we've capped it, it's created a, a higher intrinsic value in the secondary market? Right, and you know, there are some that say we should limit only the downtown so there can only be X number in the downtown. Uh, and I'm not supportive of the idea. I'm okay if we have a conversation as broadly. It's kind of the essence we have to put that. Wait till that comes Just know that conversation is out there. Okay, so uh, review of waste disposal requirements. We don't really have anything in front of it. Did you guys um, compare any thoughts on that? Uh, no, is it perfectly good answer? Okay, right. We don't have, I don't think we have issues with it. Okay. Yeah, the, the only document I put yes. together is just this comparison between what's written in Title 21 and what's written in Title 10. So waste disposal is dealt with much more in, in depth in the procedures and um, how waste is supposed to be disposed of is uh, in Title 10. In Title 21, because the special use permit and the license are dealt with as one application, they have to specify what their waste disposal plan is in that application. So that's why it, it shows up in Title 21. But, um. Jenna? You just have one inconsistency with the state law, which is the root false new change to the state law. Is that, is that effective yet? I mean, the law, I know it was. Yeah, it's signed. I don't know if it's, if it's not effective now. It's like the Okay. okay, so within the next two weeks, group balls will be no longer a waste on the state side, so you're going to have some consistencies. Yeah. Okay. Chris, thanks. Um, yeah. So I agree we should work to comply with what the state's doing here, but this issue of the waste disposal brought up another concern that um, I didn't want to mention before we dealt with what we dealt with last week. And that is somebody um, in one of the emails we received when they heard about products that were like a tag on the ground from another operator at another operator's license. What was the rational way that that happened, right? If you contemplate how that could have happened, if you don't believe there was some conspiracy, then there was a vector between the two businesses. And the vector is likely the trash trucks. And uh, so there is some conversation to be had about waste handling for waste handlers who handle waste for licensed facilities. And I'm not sure what that is, but it certainly, when you contemplate, if you didn't believe someone intentionally did something negative, like to try to hurt their competitor, then you have to believe that there was some standard procedure that made that happen. And that the trash truck is really the way that that is likely to have happened. Cross-contamination. Yeah. Of course. That briefly. Is that something we might be able to let the market handle? That is to say, if I mean, presumably marijuana stores will say, you know, will not hire those waste disposal uh, uh, companies if they are cross contaminating in that way. Are there enough waste disposal companies to? I think there's only two. Yeah. And the bottom line is, if, if in fact you didn't make a mess and a mess showed up outside your dumpster, you're going to be livid and horrified and you're jumping up and down. Right. So, anyhow, there is some market forces there. We just need to be cognizant of how it might happen. We got Denali this well, There's a bunch. Oh, I mean, okay. I've only just shot around. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, and when I think of the waste, so we had an early um, application said they would have a metal hood on their dumpster to check with the waste logs. We don't do metal hoods, but now they do. So, I mean, there may, and that was a problem that we've seen where they could, and you can. You take the right. normal locking thing, you can provide that up several inches so <laughs> easily. And if you have a tool more, so you know, what I look for is do we require for them these especially augmented dumpsters? Is that what the thing is is the code already has the provisions that it's supposed to 
would be made useless before it even leaves the facility so the waste so the can really just should be irrelevant. The the marijuana should be ground and mixed and the, the it rest of it, it's already done before it even gets to the can. Yep. So the can really shouldn't be an issue at all. It's it's what takes place within the facility before that waste leaves the facility. Because that's what's that's the key right there. Assuming everyone does their job properly, but if in fact there are cross contamination issues and there's a tag from this place and some on ground weed over in another place, it certainly begs the question of is there something else we can look at? Oh, the underground weed thing was. Right. One more week, Wednesday. We can talk about it. So if everyone is grinding their weed, then it doesn't matter if you're going. Again, yeah, assuming everyone is doing the right thing, but this whole premise is based on there are operators who don't always do the right thing. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. One additional thing, you know, we, we've got a, a group of criminals out there that are looking to steal anything of value to get a fix, and maybe they're breaking into dumpsters hoping to find something that might have value, and they might be cross-contaminating from one business dumpster to another. Who knows? We have seen that issue too. I mean, there's operators that had razor wire surrounding their dumpsters um, because they've had people break in thinking that they're going to get a fix off of what was in there. Yep. You know, only to find out that it was doused in gasoline or something. Right. You know, it's uh, bleach. Uh, so, but whether that's a fault of the operator or whether that's criminal activity that's occurring, who should be punished? Well, I don't know, I don't, maybe best practices or something for your trash. I mean, I, I just know in my business, we don't put anything, it's just trash. And people go into it and dump everything out looking for some of value, and it's not going to be much in line ever. So, so this is certainly happening. They're vulnerable. I don't know if we need to make a rule, but hopefully recent actions, people will be much more attentive. And, and I tied to 21, you're supposed to frame your dumpster and if you did that again, you got some distance. Yep. So there are kind of steps like that that it seems like any business would do on their own. I was going to say, do something like a warning label, like on blow dryers, not using them in bathtubs, but warning labels on your <laughs> trash cans that say product or contents have been doused with bleach or whatever. <laughs> we'll be happy to offer a ride along for anybody who wants to go look at business dumpsters and see what really happens. The mattress goes Oh, it's off. just, yeah, it's, it's what, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I think the fact so that what happens inside of what we really yeah. need to concentrate yeah. on. Okay, so uh, what do we want to do on this? Uh, we won't finish this today. Um, we may want to move this to the next meeting, review what Ryan gave us. I think so. Okay, so we'll put this next meeting. Okay, and then, yeah, this is easy to do. And then, um, odor. Um, great, Janet gave us some of a packet here. Yeah, it's a big packet with, um, and I apologize, I tried to email it last night, but I think it was too big to get through to the mini servers, but um, it goes over what does Denver do, and it gives a draft ordinance with, um, um, how the smell is a nuisance law basically and so they have you know different like metrics you have to meet like five complaints from five different individuals that the code enforcement verifies within 30 days that's a violation and then there's a process you can you know work with the code enforcement on a compliance plan and then there's different like point systems like how much can you actually totally negate the smell during um, flowering season or cropping season and identifying those things. So um, I know we're out of time. So I could revise this um, to make it a little bit more concise and then send it back out to everybody. But we also did, you know, what does Seattle do? And then what does Oregon do? Um, and then I attached uh, also a Clark, Clark County of Nevada, their plan for odors. Um, and so there's just big packets on how you do, you know, odor in other places and then metrics of, you know, they have these like seven to one ratios and there were some words in here that I didn't know the definitions to and didn't have time to look up last night. So, um, so I'm going to look those up because I think that has to do with, you know, how do you, 
how do you define these ratios for people that um, are doing the, the inspections and whatnot? So it's not just a, can you smell it? If you can smell it, it's a violation. There's other steps. Okay. So I think there's a lot to be considered there. Yeah. Jack's about shaking his head about to come off earlier. <laughs> Jack, can you tell us your view on this? My view on this is on number two on uh, 1084.30, restricted access area. Last paragraph of uh, number two, it says, except as allowed by special land use permit for marijuana, to remove that. And other than that, I think everything's working oh, fine. The rich, I'm sorry. Where's 10830? Yeah, 108430. Oh, yeah, it's not a. Are you getting rid of any language there? Oh, and I'm sorry, repeat that. It says, Look, number two is the, in, in total reads, does not emit an odor that is detectable by the public from outside the marijuana cultivation facility, except as allowed by special land use permit for marijuana. Eliminate the except as allowed by special land use permit for for marijuana because it infers that it does it is permitted as long as it there's a, a level of the license, whether well, it's ventilation or whatever. But under Title 21, it is allowed to the lot line, which is Title 21 is where you get your special land. That is true. Right. What, what Jack was talking about, the, what, there is a, that's been a problem. Is there's some language in some of the permits that <clears throat> says if marijuana there is detectable outside of the facility, you may need to increase your ventilation capacity. So basically, makes that sense that whole paragraph uses as far as enforcement goes. If that's contained within, within the facility. Okay, so that's a stumbling block. And we're we're designing to. It seems like we're designing to the five percent instead of the ninety-five. The odor charge for well, most businesses has not been a, an issue. Mr. Rivera is here to talk about this item, right? Uh, yeah, um, this was a, a particular item that I was interested in. Um, but I guess since we don't have time. I can go ahead and just wait, but I, I did read this uh, study that you sent us, and um, and I'd like to get this packet as well. It looks like there um, may be some uh, further things that we can do, but um, you know, just as an anecdote, uh, odor um, I, I think is an issue at several of these locations, and the industry I think is having a difficult time figuring out what to do with it. So I think if we can work with them to figure something out, the better for all of us, I think. Okay. Chris, uh, previously a member had spoken that you had some experience with kids and smoke. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I work uh, at an agency with youth, and um, we actually go to uh, trendsetters to get haircuts, uh, the Northern Lights location. And... Um, However, it happens there are actually two marijuana establishments um, right next to trendsetters. And so when I take these youth there, who many of them have uh, substance abuse issues in their past, they smell the marijuana, it triggers them. And, um, so it, it, it's an issue um, for, for these kids at that particular location. Okay, good. Thank you. Order, what do you want to do? Kick this down to the next meeting if we have? We have a marijuana license for that one. So we have one marijuana license. We have just one for that next meeting. So address this again. Okay. Okay. And we have audience, partici audience participation. Can I just make one comment? Um, I have a client that's doing a food drive, um, Arctic Herbery. They're, they're he's wanting to do this food drive, um, but the food bank decided that they didn't want to accept the food because they get federal funding. Um, so does anybody know of a good local food? Well, I don't uh, like a food bank or, or somebody that would take, want to take that I could. Like Catholic or, Charities or something like that? I, okay, like Catholic Charities. Right, I think they've got a food bank over there. Okay. Okay. So so there's also Brother yeah. Beans Cafe. Be Beans Cafe? Doesn't, doesn't Beans take more like number 12 can kind of stuff, not like the small things? They'll like take that. whatever you want. Take whatever? Okay. And then also the Lutheran Social Services takes that as well as Catholic Social Services. Does too. I, I think this food bank distributes to other groups. So if you got their list of groups, you may be able to just pick one of them. Just go directly. Uh, uh, yeah, because they wouldn't even give them a uh, barrel. So we're just going to make our own barrel. Okay. Um, 
I guess I would like to just point out Jaden Hartford is a UAA student who is in the intern program. So we'll be working with me for the next. Are we doing two semesters? This semester. This semester. Okay. He's tagging a lot of watching how interesting this job is. The glamour of being on this. Anything else? All right. Thank you.